Hello everyone, it's Bubonic Zombie. Bubonic Zombie, welcome back to Along the Edge. So, I'm gonna be honest with you guys, even though we just met him in the story, I'm feeling pretty attached to Frank. He seems like a really good guy. Um, our character certainly cares about him. And it's good to know that um, their breakup wasn't because... Uh, they didn't get along with each other, but because of the tragedy of losing a child, which is straining on any relationship. So let's get to it. I'm going to try to keep these episodes um, 20 to 30 minutes. Again, I don't want to stop in a weird spot. I'm not going to stop in, in the middle of dialogue. So I tr I'll try to keep it short, 20 to 30 minutes, stopping on scenes like these, like these cutscenes. Okay, so here we go. The day flies by, fast as an arrow. I must admit, I'm not thinking straight with all that happened since yesterday. When I get to the castle, the lights are already on. Even if it's temporary, I'm glad not to be alone for a while. It's a nice change from the solitude I've experienced these last weeks. Frank has lit up the fireplace, and delicious smells are coming out of the kitchen. It seems almost too perfect, and I have a hard time refraining myself from taking advantage of Frank's kidness, who seems determined to see my every need. I'm pretty sure that's supposed to be kindness. Still, he manages to remain quite discreet. We take our meals together, but we otherwise tend to our things in different parts of the house. As promised, about ten days later, he tells me he's rented a small furnished flat in the village and he's moving in the next day. I was a bit relieved to see him go. I had this feeling that if he stayed a bit longer, the situation would have become awkward. Days, then weeks go by, and I get back into my routine between the school, the village, and the house. I'm taking a walk in the forest. The leaves are already turning and the trees have dressed up with the flaming colors of fall. It's getting late, but I'm too busy strolling on the path. I realize it's almost dark. I can see the castle at the end of the trail, but as soon as I get closer, it seems to move away from me. I feel like there is a presence behind my back. Something deeply evil, ominous. Almost sickening. I start running. The houses disappear completely, and I find myself in a kind of meadow. There's something there at the center of it that's gently reflecting the moonlight. As I get closer, I discover it's an oval pool filled with a silvery liquid. I look at my reflection, and it's both me and not me at the same time. This feeling of altery gets stronger and stronger as I get closer. I can make out my facial features, but something has changed. I'm barefoot. There's something different in my bearing, the way I walk. My hair is longer. It reaches the middle of my back. The strange is all this is pure white. I seem so calm and at peace. I reach toward the reflecting surface, my index stretched out, and the mirror starts to stir, as if it was resonating. When my finger gets in contact with the cold and stringly moist surface, it breaks into a thousand pieces. For a while, darkness is complete. I'm in a kind of garden, surrounded by a heavy fog. I'm moving toward a reddish light source that's calling to me like a lighthouse in a woolly, muffled storm. I can make out a statue of a kind of human-sized sphinx carved in granite. There is something majestic but profoundly sad in the hunched-up, impassable attitude of the creature. When I'm close enough to distinguish its face, I realize the creature creature and I look exactly alike. I see my face reflected in hers like in a mirror. Then the eyes begin to animate and the imploring, helpless look seems to call for mercy. 
I'm frozen in contemplation, my heart overflowing with sadness and awe, when once again I feel the sickening presence, like a tepid breath on my nape. Seized by terror, I struggle to turn around, and suddenly I'm falling endlessly before darkness encompasses me. That's when I burst out of sleep. Chapter 3 October I'm bare feet in the grass. In front of me, the black mass of the forest seems to invite me. I feel a hand on my forearm. Miss? I heard noise, so I came looking. Miss Bertine is standing next to me. She looks worried. What? What am I doing here? What happened? A bad dream, miss. Just a bad dream. Come, let's get you back to bed. It's the forest, right? The Sphinx calling me. Mrs. Burton guides me back to the be to my bedroom. I fall again into a dreamless sleep. When I rise again, the sun is already high. I'm surprised to see Mrs. Bertine is still here, asleep in a chair on the other side of the room. She's sleeping so peacefully, I feel almost guilty to wake her up. Mrs. Bertine? Oh, hello, Miss Daphne. I'm sorry, I must have fallen asleep. <laughs> fallen asleep? But what are you doing here? Oh, you don't remember? You gave us quite a fright yesterday night. My husband heard you go out. He heard some noise and went to check what it was. When he saw you, he woke me up so I brought you back to bed. We're used to it anyway. It happened to Madam, your grandmother, from time to time. Once or twice a month. We used to find her wandering in the garden, and we put her back to bed. Must be the moon. The moon? Sure, she used to do this on full moons. You know what they say, right? With the full moon. I... I, I see the... I see the connection. Yes, you must be right. Ah, well, a full moon had always bring something with it. Must beware of the full moon dreams. Hmm. Let's see, do I be up front with her or do I just say thank you? I am going to go with... You know what, at this point she's like family. So I'm just I'm just gonna be honest. Had a strange dream. Since you're talking about this, I had a strange dream. I'm in the forest, then there's a mirror and a sphinx. A sphinx, you say? It's on the coast of the arms of your family, don't you know? Maybe you saw it there. Well, perhaps. The coat of arms? Yes, that's right. A blazon of the Delatoise. Give it a look. It's carved on the wall of the tower. A blazon with the tower and a sphinx. A bit like the one from the pyramids. I'll take a look when I get the chance. Thanks. Maybe I saw it there indeed. Well, miss, if you don't need me anymore, I'll go back to the outbuilding. Jared must be waiting for me to prepare his snack. Yes, of course. By all means. I'll manage on my own. In this case, have a good day, miss, if you need anything. Mrs. Burting leaves the room and leaves me alone with my questions. I'm telling myself it might be time to call Dr. Durant. He told me I could call him if I felt the need, and I'm afraid that time has come. I'm not so sure he can do anything for me, but it's worth a try. I take the phone and dial his number. Hello? Dr. Durant, Daphne Delatour speaking. Ah, hello Daphne. Why are you calling? You told me I could call. Tr 
true, but you left me without news since August, and now you're calling me on a Sunday morning. I guess it must be important. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. I can call you back tomorrow if you prefer. No, you were right to call me. That's precisely why I gave you this number. And I'll be more tuned in than tomorrow between two patients. I quickly go through everything that happened since I arrived. I finished with this recurring dream and what happened last night. Listen, Daphne, I understand why you have called me, but there's no cause for alarm. There's no proven treatment for somnambulism, and everything points to an isolated crisis, certainly due to your new environment. But you do have an explanation for this dream, don't you? Well, for this, we can look into psychoanalysis. Tell me, how would you interpret it? Let's see. To me, it felt like things to come. I, I don't know. The stream, it was really strange. I feel like it was almost premonitory. You're entitled to your beliefs, Daphne, but allow me to remind you that you're the master of your own destiny. Don't forget it. Even if this dream was indeed premonitory, sorry I'm butchering that word, guys, as you say, don't let yourself be trapped by the idea that you can't change your fate. Yes, you must be right. Most of all, don't push yourself too hard. Take some time to think about it. You went through a lot of changes. You have to get your bearings and everything will be alright. You'll see. Thank you, Doctor. You told me your ex-partner paid you a visit. How'd you see things on this matter? Uh, I feel like we should give him a chance. I don't think it was that intrusive, honestly. Um... And, you know what? I, I, I want to give him a chance. I want to. I wonder if it wasn't wrong to throw away what we had. Our relationship deserves another chance. They get it through before rushing into things is important, but don't hesitate too much. You have a shot at picking up the pieces, as they say. Frank seems to have made it very clear. And you must have noticed he didn't come all this way just to say hello. Anyway, if you really want to make it work, you'll have to attend to it soon, because you might lose patience before you're ready. Very well, Doctor. So, you've mentioned a young man called something like... Stanislas? Is that right? Stanislas... Uh, was that the Maltairs? I can't remember if that was the Maltairs. Young, oh, young man. Okay, I believe we're talking about the Maltairs. And we did, she did say we mentioned everything that was going on. Okay. Yeah, I don't have much to say. It's right, but I don't see what he has to do with my relationship with Frank. Don't work yourself up. I'm just surprised you took the time to tell me every detail of your meeting with this man, since you only saw him for a couple of minutes. I can see where you're going, but I'm afraid you're on the wrong track. Me and this Maltair? Okay, yes, yeah, so that is. I forgot his first name, I just knew him as the Maltair kid. No. It hasn't crossed my mind. I'm not necessarily talking about a romantic relationship, but I'm trying to point out possible social issues. You left in order to start anew, didn't you? One last thing, before we go back to our Sunday activities. Yes? How do you feel about your new job? Um, I don't know how Daphne feels, but I've... I personally enjoy working with kids, and I feel like this is a good place for us, and it seems like she's enjoying it. Um, 
yeah, we have to deal with the um, Jean Baptiste's mother, but I I like it. I know I was unsure when I left, but believe it or not, I just love this new job. It was perfectly normal to be anxious in your situation. I was sure you would enjoy it. You were right. Teaching is really fulfilling. It's a great satisfaction to enable these young brains to get a grip on complex notions. I'm glad to hear that. Hang on to this positive element. It will help you go through the test that life ha is throwing at you. Alright. Daphne, I'm sorry but I have to hang up. I'm glad to hear you're more at ease. And to repeat myself, there's nothing to worry about. It's more than normal to need time to get your bearings. I'm glad to hear you say that. As for your sleepwalking episode, be watchful, but don't be alarmed. You tell me about the wardens living nearby. Perhaps you can ask them to be on their guard. In case this happens again? Feel free to call me again if you ever feel the need. And, if needed, I'll refer you to a colleague in your area. Okay. Oh, and unless it's a case of emergency, try to check the day of the week before throwing yourself on the phone next time. Yes, sure, Doctor. I'll try my best to have my next... Sonambulism crisis on a weeknight. Alright, no need to linger on this. Have an excellent Sunday. Thanks, you too. As I slowly recover from my night, slumped on the sofa with a good book and a cup of tea, I hear someone knocking. I'm surprised to find Frank, smiling, on the other side of the threshold, holding a bouquet of flowers. Carnations, your favorites. When I saw them at the market, I thought about you right away. He hands me the bouquet as he enters the hall. Would you offer me a coffee? Sure. Sure. So, do you like it here? At the village? He follows me to the kitchen. I put the flowers in the vase and turn to the espresso maker. Well, I'm doing alright. Found a couple of jobs, including big roof repairs. What's really pleasant around here is that people are so easy to work with. They don't ask you to justify yourself at each step, and they don't entertain wick wacky notions about how I should do my work. What about you? How are you doing? We chit chat for a while. In passing, I tell him about my eventful night. I listen to him with one ear while sorting out the family albums. Two coffees and an hour later, Frank finally decides to get into the thick of it. You told me about this tower without a door, remember? I'm a bit intrigued by all this. Do you mind if I have a look? Make yourself at home. I'm as a treat as you are. I'm wondering what might be inside. In this case, I'm going to investigate, and I'll give you my report. Do you want to look for an old pipe? It would complete your panap panoply, don't you think, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Stop laughing at me! I'm sure I can resolve this mystery of the yellow room. Then, Frank goes to do his stuff, which allows me to get back to my thriller and my plaid. He reappears late in the afternoon, his coat covered in dust and shoes equally covered with mud. So, from the look on your face, I'm quite sure you got nothing to say elementary, my dear Watson. Nope. I must admit my defeat. Then what are your conclusions? There must be an interest somewhere, but I couldn't find it. I try to get in by the wall, with the ladder, but the arrow slits are too narrow and too deep. I can't make anything out. Even less get through. Even less get through. Unless I blow up parts of the wall. Miss Burton found me doing my acrobatic act, 
So I asked her for a couple of questions. Seems like she has no idea what's inside either. Told you. When I entertained the idea to get back by the roof, she dissuaded me vehemently. Looks like the roof hides, in fact, an older stone ceiling with no way in either. And when I try to wrap my mind around the kind of scaffolding I need to get up there, I'd rather take her word for it. Well, at least you've tried. Sure. Well, I gotta go. Big day tomorrow. Thanks for the coffee. You're welcome. Good evening. See you. That was very pleasant. I like that. I didn't dream of anything that night. Monday was particularly tiresome. I don't know if it's the students who were in cahoots to make me suffer, or if it's just that I have completely recovered from my weekend. To top it all off, as I get to the school gates, I catch a glimpse of Mrs. Levesque waiting for her son and looking at me menacingly. I'm quite sure she's about to jump on the occasion to antagonize me. After a long day, I must admit it's tempting to try to dodge her, even if it's not very professional. As I'm considering my options, I notice she's already walking resolutely towards me. What should I do? You know what? I'm I'm going to not necessarily confront, but I'm not going to avoid her. Let's see. Let's see what happens. I might regret this. I prepare myself to have a hard time when I feel a hand on my forearm. Ah, Miss Delatois, I'm in luck. I just wanted to talk to you about something. Stanislas Malter, holding a young child by the hand. Miss Levesse immediately turns on her heels and goes back outside the gates. Pierre Yves Maltaire. Uncle Stan, who's this lady? Well, Pierre, the pretty lady, is Daphne Delatour. She lives at the castle. At the castle of the witch? You're not a witch, Mrs. Daphne, are you? Forgive him. As you can see, he's not afraid to speak his mind. He adds, winking at me. He must take a little bit after his uncle. I crouch to put myself at the child's height. Let's see. You know what? I Kids believe a lot of stuff, and it's hard to convince them otherwise. Um, so I'm just gonna... I'm a nice witch! Since I live in a castle of the witch, that means I must be a rich wife. He hides behind his uncle's leg, intimidated. Yes? In this case, I must definitely be one. But maybe I'm a nice kind of witch, don't you think? It does exist, a nice witch, Uncle Stan. Of course it does! Miss Delatour is a teacher at the middle school. She knows about things. I get back up and I notice Stanilus is putting out his hand. I don't believe we've been formally introduced. Stanilus Maltaire, my friend's commissaire. Daphne Delatois. Well, it seems you already know it. Of course! I'm sure you've noticed how fast the news spreads around here, Daphne. Can I call you Daphne? My father discovered something was going on at the castle. He had to know what was happening. Please excuse him. The poor man is obsessed with the Delatoires. But don't let it, this put you off. The rest of the family is not all cut from the same cloth. We had to take a coffee together one of these days to get to know each other. I'm sure we have a lot in common. Before I have a chance to answer, he adds, By the way, you must have received your invitation for the cocktail party, haven't you? The cocktail party? I hope you're coming. My father forces me to attend, but it's an ostracy stuffy. Atrociously, sorry. Uncle Sam, can I have my afternoon snack? Yes, Pierre, in a minute. So, Junior wants his four o'clock snack. Say goodbye to Daphne, Pierre. Uh, my name is Pierre Eves, not Junior. The child takes my hand. 
Are you coming, Auntie Daphne? Didn't take him long to succumb to your charms. Auntie Daphne has things to do. She can't come with us this time. Let's go home. You're driving. For real? Of course not. Daphne, pleased to meet you. See you soon. In an instant, Stan and Junior disappear in a sports car, and I remain speechless on the sidewalk, trying to sort out what just happened. That was pretty overwhelming. When I get back home, I discover I have mail. It's a nice square envelope that contains an invitation to a cocktail. I guess that's what the Stanil what Stanilus was talking about. Looks like I've been invited to the reopening of the City Hall's gardens that just went through renovations. I bet all the local upper crust will attend, so it'll be an excellent excuse to learn more about the Maltairs. I could ask Frank to come with me, but I know this kind of social event isn't really his cup of tea. On the other hand, going alone... Mm, you know what? It'd also be great to get Frank to get to know the Maltairs as well. Kind of like keep him in the know. So I'm going to ask. He, he can always say no. I take my phone and ask Frank to come with me. Frank isn't thrilled by the idea of putting on a suit. I guess I could convince him, but I have to be very persuasive. Mmm. I'd rather drop it rather than force his hand. But D-Day comes quickly. As I get ready for the evening, I'm confronted to an existential dilemma. I can deduce from the invitation card that proper attire is required, so I don't see myself hanging in there in a denim and a twin set. I don't own anything remotely f appropriate for this kind of occasion, but after raiding the wardrobe of my mother's room, I find two dresses that might somewhat do the job. I just can't choose. On one hand, there's this long dress, empire style. I guess it's more the taste and the criteria of elegance of my grandmother. To be honest, I don't see my mother wearing this spontaneously. It's pastel blue, usually the kind of color that agrees with my complexion. The other option is a black strapless dress, short and tight-fitting. I can imagine my mother wearing this. It's really the kind of garment she must have worn when getting out. Contrary to the blue one, it leaves very little to the imagination, between the bare shoulders and the shortness of the skirt. Which one should I choose? Mm, I personally don't like short strapless dresses. Um, I'm going to go with the long blue one, because that's what I would wear. Oh, that's lovely. I might be a little overdressed, but I think this option is the most reasonable. Yep, yeah, I like this. Now that I've dealt with the dress, I just have to do something with my hair. Dressed in a nice updo, and a touch of makeup later, I'm ready to leave. It's already late when I leave the house. I get inside my small car, and, after a quick ride, I'm there. Okay, so, we are going to leave it here for now. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you later. Bye!